This video is sponsored by NordVPN. After finally breaking free of their quiet home island, expecting smooth sailing all the way to a tropical paradise, teenage castaways instead found themselves adrift for eight days with no land in sight, rationing what little they had, pitted in a fight against nature itself. This is the story of six young boys who not only survived, but thrived on an uninhabited island for 15 months with nothing but their bare hands and friendships that could weather any tropical storm. This is the real life Lord of the Flies. I don't know how you feel about your hometown, but if my hometown was an island of 200 people, I might want to take a vacation too. 1965. The quiet island of Ha'afeva on the Tongan archipelago in the center of the Pacific Ocean. The boys attended St. Andrew's College, a boarding school, and felt more confined than ever. For teenage friends, Sione, Stephen, Kolo, David, Luke, and Mano, Truancy was far more interesting than fluency. Mano, who was 15 and one of the eldest, was asked if he wanted to go to Fiji. He said yes, and that was all they needed to begin preparations. The boys didn't really care where they went, they just wanted to see the world. The escape was soon drafted, but they still had one major problem. None of them had a boat. The six of them were resourceful, however, and they weren't going to let a little thing like personal ownership stopped them. So they scoped out the sailboat of a local fisherman they all hated, Tanila Uhila. Snatching the sailboat in a particularly diabolical lick, the boys now had transport. All that was left was supplies. The boys set out to collect what they needed, namely two sacks of bananas, a few coconuts, and a small gas stove. They didn't think of bringing a compass, not even a map. To illustrate exactly how grave of a mistake that was, we can look at the distance between the island of Tonga Tapu, the largest island in Tonga, and Fiji, a distance of over 750 kilometers, or if you speak American, 450 miles. Point being, it's a heck of a long boat ride. I don't know the last time you tried to navigate across an ocean, but to be honest, even with a map and compass, the ocean is still a vast expanse containing creatures the likes of which none of us have ever seen. Literally my worst nightmare. The boys began their journey one hot evening in June. The weather was good, only a mild breeze to carry them over the horizon. The sea remained calm, but this is when the boys made their next mistake. As the night grew longer, the boys grew tired and eventually they all fell to sleep. They were only able to rest for a couple hours before a storm ratcheted over them, sending them tumbling across the deck. They tried to hoist the sail and regain control of the boat, but the winds were too strong. Their sail was almost instantly torn and flew away in the intense turbulence. As they tried to keep their vessel afloat, a sickening crack echoed through the hull. For a moment, it felt like they had been breached, sending fears that they were taking on water, shooting through the six boys' mind. But the truth was no better. They weren't taking on water, but their rudder had broken. So while they weren't going to sink into the sea, at least not immediately, they had no way to steer, nor propel themselves to shore in the meantime. All there was left to do was ration any supplies they had and wait. Eight days, they drifted at sea. With no sign of land and no food or water, things looked dire for the six lads. First, they tried to catch fish, but to no avail. Prudently, they used the coconuts they brought with them and tins they found on board to catch rainwater and rationed it strictly, giving each boy exactly one sip of water in the morning and another sip in the evening. Some of the boys began to cry, but there was nothing they could do. In Mano's words, we tried to keep our hopes up but I was worried we might die. Then, on the eighth day, a miracle appeared on the horizon in the form of a lumbering hunk of craggy rock, sticking out a thousand feet above the ocean. This island is still considered uninhabitable to this day, but to them, it was their salvation. This is the island of Atta. Atta was inhabited by the boys' Tongan ancestors at one point, 
But due to the trickery of some Peruvian, uh, forced labor organizers in the 1860s, half the island's population was abducted and sold to Peruvian labor camps to harvest guano. Around 130 men and women were taken from a population of only around 350. The island would remain uninhabited until the arrival of six lucky, or unlucky, young Tongans roughly a hundred years later. Around nine in the morning, the boys spotted the island. It was still far in the distance, not much more than a speck. As the day grew before them, the wind carried them closer and closer. Around 11 p.m., they arrived at a short distance from the shore. Mano then said a prayer with the boys, before turning to them and saying, Don't get out of the boat until I find out what's there. Well, regardless, I'd rather take my chances out there than spend the rest of my life talking to a basketball! Franklin! 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 Oh god, no! Well, looks like it's that time again. It's, it's time to get Zen with NordVPN! Or at least it's time for geo-locked content to become a thing of the past. Because NordVPN makes it easy to access any content from anywhere in the world. It's, it's not just for TV, Grill. Nord will even protect your data even when you're using public Wi-Fi. We can even have six different VPN connections on multiple devices at the same time. And don't worry, they've got a service for every major platform. Mac OS, iOS, Android, Windows, and even Linux for all those computer nerds out there. Nord has 5,200 servers in 60 countries, no data logging, and, and double encryption too. Not to mention their 24-7 customer service support. That's right. Go to nordvpn.com slash brew to get a two-year plan plus one additional month with a giant discount. Nord is also offering a 30-day money-back guarantee to sweeten the deal. Okay, okay, jeez, turn it on already. Bro, if you finish the Lordy Flyboys or whatever you're talking about, you can join us and watch a real-life tale of survival. Wait, wait, Gorilla, I, I don't think that this movie is real. Mono jumped out of the boat and furiously swam to shore. When he got there, he said that the whole island was twisting around. But it wasn't the island. It was the dehydration and starvation. When he managed to catch his breath, he called out to the rest of the boys on the boat to come to shore. Back together, the boys took a moment to say another prayer. They were alive, marooned, but alive, for now. They then fell asleep and didn't wake up until the next morning. The first priority was to find their bearings. Climbing up to the top of the craggy peak of the island, Mano stepped on a piece of soaking wet wood, which provided him with the first real drink of water he'd had in eight days. About halfway up the island, they found makeshift knives from the island's last inhabitants. Arriving at the summit, they looked down at the cliffs around them and were filled with hope. It would be hard, but they could survive. They tried to make a fire, but without food or water, they were too weak to get it going. In those first days on the island, they survived by cutting off the tops of coconuts with stone knives in order to drink the milk inside. They harvested papaya as well. They also constructed spears, which they used to hunt fish in the shallows, and caught seabirds with their bare hands who had made their nests among the crags of the island's cliff sides. At first, there was no rain, so the boys managed to hydrate by drinking the blood of the birds that they caught. And since they didn't have a fire, they were eating raw or nothing. Not only that, upon further investigation of the summit, the boys found an ancient volcanic crater where their people had lived before the kidnapping thing. It was like their ancestors had left them gifts. They found wild taro, bananas, and wild chickens, which had been reproducing on the island without human intervention since it was abandoned. Three months into their stay, Fate managed to generate enough friction to catch a spark and start a fire. Their first hot meal in months must have tasted better than anything I could imagine. The boys' main priority going forward was to keep that fire going. But they also needed shelter. Mano began weaving coconut fronds to wall their house. It took him two weeks to finish. Their home was an A-frame lean-to nestled in among the trees. With a small twig palisade to keep out the wind, they made a fireplace in the middle and used banana leaves for bedding. Now, with shelter and fire taken care of, it was time to get the rest of the island in order. 
Mano said that they all worked together as though they'd been on the island for a long time. So they split up into teams of two and drew up a schedule for garden, kitchen, and guard duties. They also had a strict system of managing the fire so it wouldn't go out. In Sione's words, we knew if we got lazy, the island would beat us. One of the boys, Kolo, even managed to build a guitar from a piece of driftwood, half a coconut shell, and steel wires they salvaged from the shipwreck. Each of their days started and ended with a song and a short prayer. Mano said that he never really loved the island. I always wanted to go back home to see my family. A month after finally constructing a fire, they tried to build a raft. They managed to chop down some trees with makeshift knives and use their fire to cut up the limbs. Unfortunately, the raft never managed to get too far out to sea. It just lazily drifted down the beach. With all hope of escape dashed upon the rocks and bluffs of Ata, the kids settled in for long-haul survival. They built a more permanent garden, cultivating any fruits or vegetables they found on the island. Sione also recalled his father's traditional teachings of how to acquire water. He cut into trees across the island, and over the course of four days of cutting deeper and deeper, eventually water came seeping out of the trunks. The boys also built a gym with weights for lifting, a badminton court which used bird feathers for shuttlecocks, and even a pen for a chicken coop. They did all of this using a small makeshift knife, a lot of resolve, and a ton of time. Sione said, We were often unhappy, and at times we argued, but then we would walk away from our friends into the jungle. Sometimes we would cry a little. They would talk out their issues over the firelight in the evenings. If anybody had something they didn't like, they talked about it, and we said sorry, and then pray, and everything's okay. But if someone got really mad, like, if I plan something and they didn't do it, you disappear for a few hours, look at the ocean, and clear it out of your mind. But then, disaster struck. Mono and Steven had left for the cliffs to gather seabirds for dinner. They hoped to be able to each eat two birds a day. Mono had caught a couple, but Steven was unsatisfied. He went further down the cliffs, where they could find more nests. But he slipped, falling 40 feet down the bluffs and breaking his leg. Mono ran to the rest of the boys, and they found him on a slim outcropping and managed to carry him back up to the summit. They set his leg and joked, Don't worry, we'll do your work while you lie there like King Taufa Ahau Tupo himself. King Taufa Ahau was the king of the Tongans at the time. Stephen would get the royal treatment for the following four months while he healed. It's very lucky that he had support, because an injury like that is a death sentence for anyone surviving alone. Then, one day, after 15 months of tracking time by scratching tally marks into stone, watching the dry season turn wet and back to dry again, it happened. From up at the top of the island, the lookout screeched, BOAT COMING! Captain Peter Warner was the youngest son of business magnate Arthur Warner. His company, Electronic Industries, was the largest manufacturer of radios in 1930s Australia. The family was exceedingly wealthy, and like many other sons of wealthy families, Peter was always intended to become part of the business. But like six other young men with the prospect of long lives ahead of them, he wanted to rebel. So at the young age of 17, he split in search of overseas adventure. He spent the next years of his life sailing everywhere from Hong Kong to St. Petersburg. And when he finally returned, like the prodigal son he was, he brought his father his Swedish captain's license, hoping for some of Daddy's approval. But Daddy was unimpressed. Peter's old man was insistent that he take a job at one of their companies, so Peter asked, what's easiest? His father told him, accounting. But accounting was not only difficult, to Peter, it was also boring as heck. The sea still called to Peter, and whenever he had the chance to, he sailed off to Tasmania, where he moored his own fishing fleet. It was on one of these trips on his boat, the Just David, that brought him to the island of Atah. 
Peter, in an interview, said that he and his crew were experimenting with some fishing gear five or six miles off the island of Ata, which we thought was uninhabited for 60 to 70 years, when they noticed a black patch against the green background on the hills, which was interesting because that suggested something was burning. Peter thought, that's strange, that a fire should start in the tropics on an uninhabited island. Peter and his crew investigated closer, and the lookout on the mast shouted down to them that he could hear human voices. I didn't believe it was a human voice. I said, oh, that's the birds, you're crazy. But they continued ever closer. Peter kept his eye out for movement, when suddenly, a small brown figure leapt down the rocks and into the water before them. Peter was initially worried that the island could be a prison camp or some kind of dumping ground for dangerous criminals. So he loaded his rifle and signaled to his crew to do the same. He watched as this young man saddled up to his boat and said in clear English, My name is Stephen. I am one of the six castaways. We think we have been here for one and a half years. Peter thought to himself that he better let the boys aboard, so he set out the ladder, and six naked youths clambered onto the deck of the Just David. Peter remarked that they looked completely wild, they hadn't had a haircut for a long time. When they told Peter their story, he was skeptical, so he wrote their names down before calling the operator at Nukualofa, the capital of Tonga, asking, would you mind calling up St. Andrew's College? 20 minutes later, the operator called back in tears and said, It's true! These boys have been given up for dead! Funerals have been held! And now you've found them! The boys were rescued on Sunday, September 11th, 1966, a full 15 months since they left their home island of Ha'afeva to embark on that ill-fated journey to Fiji. Their story wasn't over yet, however. Once they arrived in Nukualofa, they were checked over by a local doctor, who expressed admiration of their handling of Stephen's broken leg. But once they had been looked over, they were immediately arrested. Mr. Taniela Uhila, the man whose boat they hijacked, was pressing charges against them for vehicle theft. Fifteen months may have passed since the six truants hijacked his sailboat, but he wasn't ready to let it go. In a stroke of luck, Peter realized he could save the boys once more. He figured that their story was perfect Hollywood material, a la Castaway, and since he was an accountant for his father's company, he had the ability to manage their film rights. He was also fortunate enough to have connections in the Aussie film industry. From Tonga, he called up the manager of Channel 7 in Sydney, telling them they could have the Australian rights, if they gave him the international rights. Peter then paid Mr. Ahila £150, which after inflation comes to around £2,800 today, the equivalent of 3800 American dollars, to pay for the boat the kids had stolen. The boys were then to be released if they agreed to cooperate with the film. A few days later, a team from Channel 7 arrived, and they embarked all the way back to Ata to make the movie. Three journalists dressed in pointy shoes and crisp suits sat on the deck of a chartered boat, gazing up at the tall rocks of Ata, and admitted they didn't know how to swim. Lucky for them, Peter said, These boys will save you. Once the six had been released from jail, they were welcomed in a flurry of celebration. A feast was set out for them by their families, then another was set out by the church, then a third with almost the entire population of Ha'aveva. Turning up to the party was held on behalf of the entire island. Peter himself was announced as a national hero. He even received a communique from King Taufa Ahautupo IV, inviting him for an audience with the monarch. The king said, Thank you for rescuing six of my subjects. Now, is there anything I can do for you? But Peter only humbly asked for rights to trap lobster in Tongan waters. Peter then returned to Sydney, but not before he offered the boys a chance to see the world. He resigned from his father's company, commissioned a new ship, and hired the boys as its crew. The end. Right? Not quite. While Peter and the boys returned to Tonga to cheers and jubilation, Dutch historian and author Rutger Bregman, whose book Humankind broke the story to a Western audience, was welcomed to more mixed reviews. Bregman was looking for uplifting stories to prove that humanity was inherently good. So, he used the tale of the boys' survival as a foil to William Golding's novel Lord of the Flies. 
For those of you who haven't had the chance to read it, long story short, TLDR, a bunch of English schoolboys crash land on a deserted island. They initially try to maintain order using rules, famously declaring whoever holds a specific conch shell would be the one allowed to speak. But these rules are quickly thrown away by a would-be authoritarian dictator, Jack, who organizes a militant cabal of boys obsessed with hunting a pig, who eventually go on to murder two other boys in cold blood. The main critique of Bregman's story was that it was told through a colonial lens. Prominent Tongan storyteller Malaika Gisa Fatafehi said, It was bizarre to see a story I've been told, told differently and told in a way that didn't even prioritize the story of the men. The critique is not without merit, as Golding's story was intended to speak to Europeans in the aftermath of the Second World War. Comparing the story of those Tongan lads to Golding's English schoolboys ignores that he was writing about the rise of fascism. Fascism being a form of ultra-nationalist authoritarian governance that is known by violent suppression of anyone who disagrees, strict control over society, and dictatorial power. Not to mention, comparing the two ignores the Tongan boys' indigenous upbringing as well. In short, fascism is for power-hungry losers who hate immigrants, and indigenous communities have different upbringings than those raised in colonial nations. The issue of who owns their story is also a common critique. Colonial nations like the UK, Spain, France, and Portugal filled their coffers by extracting resources from indigenous peoples in North America and beyond. Those same nations then made stories like Pocahontas and The Last of the Mohicans, which claimed to tell indigenous stories, but didn't actually include indigenous people in their production, leading to stories that were overtly biased or benignly misleading. That being said, Sione has also said, some people are blaming Mr. Warner because he is making money off of us. To those people, I say, shut up and forget about it. He is the one who rescued us. If he didn't do that, there is no way for us to come out from the island. Does the act of saving the boys give Peter Warner the right to sell their story? Can the film rights be seen as the reward for their rescue? Does the fact that he sold the rights to get the money to pay their bail change how this is interpreted? One thing is for sure, if Peter hadn't heard the call to adventure, like those boys heard the day they set sail, he might never have passed by Atta in his life, and if he hadn't been hanging around the ocean that day, those boys might never have been able to escape their craggy fate on that rock in the middle of the Pacific.